Amen. I wanted to start with a question this morning, and that is a rhetorical question. You don't have to respond out loud. Uh, as a matter of fact, please don't. Uh, why do you believe what you believe? Why do you believe what you believe? So whether that's in relation to Christianity, whether that's in relation to you know, other things of this world, like why do you believe what you believe? Why do you have such strongly held convictions? Why do you know that you know that you know that you know that what you believe is true? Um, you know, maybe you do some digging, maybe it's through research that you, you know, you find something out to be true. Uh, maybe it's just through a, a personal life experience. Maybe something had a tremendous impact uh, on you, and, and now you can, with a tremendous amount of confidence, say that something is true. Uh, but like research, for example, I did a little case study this morning uh, on a couple of our people upstairs. So there's some uh, people in the world, I don't know why they are the way that they are, but there are people in the world that prefer Androids over iPhones. Um, and, and just in case you didn't know, there are a couple up in the booth upstairs who shall remain nameless. Uh, actually, there's at least two. There's three up there because I know who has what. Uh, <laughs> but so I went to one of them and I was like, you, you, you hate iPhones, right? And she was like, yes. Oh, she... Um, <laughs> That actually just came out. Um, <laughs> so she was like, yes, I, I do. And the thing about, and at least what I've learned through my interactions with people that use Androids, again, for whatever reason, uh, is that they're very confident in their position. Uh, they, they, they know, they, they, they do the research, right? I, iPhone people don't do their research. Android people do their research, and they can tell you, they can give you a list of seven different things that make Android better than iPhone. And as an iPhone user, I can sit there all day long and listen to what they have to say and listen to what they share, and they might have really, really strong evidence, but I'm just like, I'm just going to keep buying my iPhones. I don't know why you keep talking to me about this. Um, but we have convictions of why we believe what we believe, and a lot of times, like me, we can be stubborn in what we believe what we believe. Uh, maybe you believe in other things just out of stupidity or false confidence, right? Maybe you believe football season comes around and you know the fan base that's always talking like their team's going to win it all, the Dallas Cowboys, and uh, they, they, every year the Cowboys are going to win the Super Bowl. But the problem with that is they haven't won a Super Bowl in 30 years. And so <laughs> Cowboy fans are wrong in what they believe for the last 30 years because they Football season starts in September, and every year it ends in January for the Cowboys, and the Super Bowl plays in February. Right? It, it doesn't, it, they, don't, they don't win Super Bowls like they used to. Uh, well, maybe this year. I don't know. Maybe this year is the year. I don't know. Uh, um, but we believe what we believe, and there's a reason for why we believe what we believe. And so as we apply that to more serious things like, like your faith in Jesus, why do you believe what you believe, and where does that belief come from? And so as we continue our series in the book of 1 Corinthians, it's a letter that, that Paul writes to a local church in Corinth. And we've seen over the last couple weeks that this is a church that has some issues. Uh, this is a church that has some issues because it's made up of people that have issues. In case you didn't know that, people have issues. Um, and one of the things that we see him address is that, okay, there's, there's this city where this church is located in, and it's an extremely secular City. It, the, the church itself is surrounded by people who don't really care about God or the things of God. And so it's a secular society that only thinks about themselves. And the problem with that is, is that rather than the church doing the influencing of, for Jesus on the culture that they're in, they're allowing the culture to do some influencing into the church. Right? It's the culture's way of doing things. It's their philosophies, their, their knowledge, their agendas that go against God. And those things are starting to creep into the church. And so the problem for the church is that, again, they're, they're, they're starting to look a little too much like the culture that they are supposed to be countercultural to. All right. And for the last few weeks, we've seen, the last couple of weeks, we've seen Paul give this call to unity amongst the body of believers. He implores them as, as brothers and sisters in the Lord to be united through Christ, that they would be made complete of the same mind and in the same judgment, it says in verse 10 of chapter 1. And so it's, it's a call to unity that is super, super important, again, when we consider the culture that they're living in that's hostile and goes against the gospel, and it's all about my desires, my wants, me, 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 and no matter how immoral it might be, that's, that's what they're doing, and that's what this church is surrounded by, 
And the reality is that a, a, a church that doesn't have unity in Christ, a church that's disunified, can easily be swayed by the things of the world. And, and some of that's happening for the Corinthians. And so they're called to be unified because, as we've seen over the last couple of weeks, there's a tremendous difference between the things of God and the things of man. There's a tremendous difference between the knowledge and wisdom that comes from God and the knowledge and wisdom that comes from mankind. All right, and so he, he challenges them to, to live a Christian life that, that, that takes Jesus into consideration in all things. Because they were trying to live a life on the basis of what we looked at last week, unsanctified common sense, where it's all about self. It's an attitude of, thanks God, I got it from here. Uh, and that's really, really dangerous. That's really, really dangerous, and it's having an impact on the church. And so he writes about it. And, and one of the things, too, that's important to recognize here is that as Paul gives instruction, although, they're, again, they're living in a secular society, his instruction isn't for them to leave. His instruction isn't, you know, that city's really bad. Why don't you get out of there? His instruction is to be a light for Christ where they're at. And that, that's something that we need to consider, too, right? Because of where we live in America or in, in a lot of different places in the world, it's being a Christian is you might receive some issues for it. That doesn't mean you run from the situation. It means you be a light to those people around you. So you can open up your Bible to the, the book of 1 Corinthians. We're going to uh, start off in chapter 2 this morning. And uh, Paul explains in the, in the first few verses that we're going to read, really, really the heart of the message, uh, the heart behind his preaching when he came to Corinth that's recorded uh, back in Acts chapter 16, uh, which is recorded when he, when he first shared the gospel with the people of Corinth. And, and what's really, really cool is that these people who heard the gospel, gospel from Paul, they became followers of Jesus, and, and they founded the church, and that's who he's writing to now. All right, so 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1, uh, that's where we're going to begin this morning. And here's what Paul says, again, in reference to the time that he came to them. He says, when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing about you, among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. In my message, in my preaching, were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. You see, what Paul's getting at here is Paul doesn't speak or, or share the gospel or share whatever he wants to share so that you would think much of him. He shares so that you and I and the church would, would think much of of Jesus and make much of Jesus in, in, their, in their walk, in their daily life. Um, because it's the truth of the saving power of Jesus Christ that he wants them to recognize through the, the true testimony, the true evidence, the true proof of what Jesus has done. Right When the disciples were, were preaching in the book of Acts, they're preaching based on the testimony of a crucified and resurrected king named Jesus. That's their standing, that's their, their foundation, that's it, it's Jesus, and that's ours too, right? We, we can't come on the basis of something else because there's no other leg to stand on but Jesus who, who came and died, lived a perfect sinless life, came and died, was killed on a cross and resurrected. Praise God, and that's the message that we have to share. And so, Paul, here too, he acknowledges the fact that he, he speaks out of a reliance on God and the leading of the Holy Spirit so that their faith, as it says, wouldn't be found in human wisdom, but would be found in God's power. Again, Paul's very clear. He's not about impressing them with, with the way that he's presenting this message. He's not about uh, you know, using some tactics to, to make them believe something they really maybe shouldn't. Like He's all about impressing them with Jesus. And again, this is a culture who can be easily swayed. So it would have been easy for Paul to say, hey, there's like this secret knowledge that, that you can find out about, but it's not tied to the gospel. Well, here it is. Uh, but the, the knowledge and the wisdom that he discusses is, is really primarily and always tied to the gospel. Um, and, you know, when I say that, I, I can't help but think of one of the priorities that we've had here as a church at Grace Gospel is, you know, over the last few years, this year and, and continuing into the future is a priority on attraction. Uh, that we would be attracting people toward Jesus. It's not about me. It's not about 
our, ourselves. It's not about the lights. It's not about the videos. It's, it's, it's about Jesus. Every event, every ministry, everything is about pointing people to a Savior named Jesus. That's what it's all about. And really, that's kind of what Paul's discussing here. Um, you know, we can fancify everything. We can do all of these things. But if the, the bottom line isn't the gospel, then what are we doing? And so for us here, it's going to be the gospel always and an attraction always toward Jesus, not of ourselves. Uh, Matthew 5, 16, Jesus speaks to this. He says, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. It's not to let our light shine so that they would think much of us. It's to let our light shine so that they would think much of Jesus, bringing honor and glory alone to the one who is worthy. You know, and one of the things that I think of when, you know, we read this passage that we're in this morning is that, you know, the, the tremendous thing about Paul and not wanting to be impressed with him, it didn't lead to him shrinking back on the truth. You know, he, he says, Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's the message. That's the whole point Paul gets to over and over and over again. His point wasn't angled in some way that they would manip be manipulated into thinking something that, that's wrong. It's all rooted in the truth of the gospel. You know, and he's like, when I showed up to start this church in Corinth, I didn't, I didn't speak to deceive you of, of, of this thing or that thing. I didn't promise you with a prosperity gospel. I didn't use some language, again, into making you think something that's wrong. Uh, he says, I just came to speak the name of Jesus Christ and him crucified. And why is that? Because really, that's all that matters. It's about Jesus, the person and work of what he has Done and, and to me, I, again, I think about Paul, like that's not only evident in what he says here, but it's evident in the life that he lived. Paul lived a, 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 a worldly, in a worldly sense, a difficult life for his stance on, on the truth of the gospel. He was martyred for the truth of the gospel. Uh, you know, he, he had tremendous persecution that he, he faced. He was imprisoned multiple times. Uh, Paul wasn't out for everybody to like him or else he would have done things a little differently. Paul was out so that people would hear the truth of Jesus. Again, he's not persuading them wrongly. He's persuading them toward a crucified and resurrected king. And he's doing this, again, verse 5, through the power of the Holy Spirit, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. So in other words, that question that we asked at the beginning, why do you believe what you believe well, what Paul's getting to here is like no one in the Corinthian church can stand up and say, well, one time I heard a really, really good message. The speaker was really, really great. That doesn't save us, right? It's, it, one time the worship was really, really good or the, the people were really, really nice and friendly. That's great, but what's the point? What's the point of the church? The point of the church is Jesus because people can have a faith in a lot of different things, and that doesn't make it right. People can put their faith in, in, in different things. That's why there's so many world religions and in, in different things that we think are going to get us to heaven. But really, there's only one faith that does that, and that is faith in Jesus. You know, people say all the time, well, you know, I have faith. I'm spiritual. You ever heard that one? I'm spiritual. What does that mean? Give me a little more. If it's not a belief in Jesus, it's separation from God. That's what the Bible reveals to us. It's faith that rests on the, on the power of God, the power of God that, that overcame the grave by sending Jesus, the power of God that makes a way when there is no other way, and that's the truth. You know, faith in a, in a human ability or a human strength, it, it really undermines the significance and the power that's found in the cross, right? When we think we can do things our way, we're making less of the cross and, and more of us. Right? The, the cross is what speaks to the brokenness and the weakness and the sin problem that we all have, and it deals with it head on. And the cross is the only thing that can do that. Nothing in our own strength, nothing in our own knowledge, nothing in our own trying to get ourselves out of a situation. The cross is the only thing that can get us out of our situation that we have, and that's sin. All right, and so Paul's going to continue as he, as he talks about, again, kind of like we did last week, a, a comparison between worldly wisdom and that which comes from God, true wisdom which comes from above. So look at verse 6 as he continues. He says, yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature. A wisdom, however, not of this age nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away. 
but we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory, the wisdom which none of the rulers of this age had understood. For if they had understood it, they would have not have crucified the Lord of glory. But just as it is written, things which I ha- which I has not seen and ear has not heard, and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. For to us, God revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. The wisdom that comes from God is rejected by the rulers of this world, and it's a wisdom that's granted to believers. It's not a wisdom that we, again, discover on our own, but it's God's revelation to us. He, he reveals it to us through the Spirit of God. And so that's why, that's why godly wisdom is foreign to the secular society that they're living in and to the secular society that we're living in. Because man's wisdom is different from God's wisdom. This is a church that, that's fixated on knowledge and, and, and philosophy and learning the, the next big new thing, but knowledge is not wisdom. Wisdom is when we apply knowledge. And, and, and godly wisdom, that, that which comes from God, makes no sense to the world. We looked at these couple verses last week in Hebrews as we talk about faith's role in this. Faith is what? The assurance of things hoped for, and it's the conviction of things not seen. And without faith, Hebrews 11, verse 6, it is impossible to please him. Who? God. It's impossible to please God without faith, for he who comes to God must believe that he is And that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. See, in Christ you are driven by faith in God. And true wisdom that comes from God comes through faith in God. And as it says in verse 7, it's a mystery. A a hidden wisdom that's revealed through the Spirit. The evidence of the truth of the gospel is is really even apparent in God. In all of this, right, we know that we're all sinners, we're in need of a Savior, we're born into sin, and apart from Christ, we're still in our sin. And so as you connect that with what Paul's saying here, there's a barrier to this secret wisdom that he's speaking of, this hidden wisdom, and that barrier is that you need to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. Right? The Bible tells us that in doing that, you become a new creation, the old self is gone, the new has come, a new life. And you have the righteousness of Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit living in you, and that hidden wisdom is now made available to you, and, as he discusses here, it's, it's a wisdom that the world doesn't know. And so that for the wisdom that he's talking about, faith is required. Otherwise, it just doesn't make sense, right? Paul said in chapter 1 that the message of the cross, the message of the cross is foolish to a secular society. Think about it, though. Like, think about how that applies to our world today, right? If you're a Christian and you're living out your faith the way that you're supposed to, you're going to get some weird looks. You're, you're going to get uh, people that don't think it makes sense to do what you're doing, right? You're, 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 you're choosing to pray to this God that you believe in. You're choosing to, on big decisions, on small decisions, you're, you're, you're choosing to be in church on a Sunday. I mean, that's gone in today's world. Right? Like you're, you're choosing to, to make church a priority over this or that. You really believe in that? Right? You're, you're choosing, you're choosing to, to serve God. You're choosing to, to give. You're choosing to give money to that organization. It, it doesn't make sense to the world. Uh, and please continue to give because I like my job. Um, <laughs> but it, to the world, it, it doesn't make sense. To the world, it's foreign. To the world... You're, you're doing something that you should not be doing. Why? Because they don't have that kind of wisdom that we can have through Christ. Just as, again, it says in these verses, it, it's not a wisdom of, of this age. It doesn't come from any earthly ruler. All of that is fading away. Verse 6, wisdom not of this age nor of the rulers of this age who are, who are passing away. Some translations say that, that, that they are coming to nothing. And that's where the wisdom of this world ultimately leads. It leads to nothing. It leads to emptiness because it's a wisdom that is not rooted in God and his truth. It's rooted in what humanity says is best. And this is a concept that that dates all the way back to the beginning, the book of Genesis, right? An enemy of God 
comes to Adam and Eve and sparks some doubt. He's like, you know, did God really say that? Is God really that wise? Does he really know what he's talking about? Did he really say you can't do that? Right? He sparks doubt and fear into the situation. Think about what you're missing out on, right? And see, man's wisdom, what we learned right there from the beginning, man's wisdom doesn't necessarily always cut God out of the equation, right? Man's wisdom can sometimes make God look like the bad guy in the equation, right? It doesn't, doesn't cut God out and say there is no God. It just says he's not good, or he's not wise, or you know better, or you're smarter. You've got this, like, that's what the world does, right? If, there, if, there's, if there's evil in this world, that means God must be to blame, uh, I'm still in school, if you don't know. I just wrote a very, very long paper on the, the topic of, of, of how God can exist simultaneously with the presence of evil. All right? Fun topic. And I'll tell you something, that if you're a Christian in this room, you believe that to be true. God exists. You believe that through the blood of Jesus and what he's done for you. But you also acknowledge that there's evil that exists in this world. And, and the reality is there are people in this world who believe that, well, God can exist. God can't be real. Look, look what's going on around us. And if he is real, he can't be good because of all this going on around us. All this, all this evil, all, this, all these bad things that, that happen in the world. But the reality is that, as we see in Genesis, God is not to blame. It's man that's deserving of blame. We deserve nothing. And yet God made a way for our relationship with him to be restored through Jesus. Right? We, because of our sin, we deserve nothing. And we can cling to the hope of an eternity spent with our Savior where there is no sin and no evil, no more. Praise God. Look again at verse 10. It says, for, us, for to us God revealed them through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. So true wisdom revealed through the Spirit of God is not one that only lasts for a little while. It lasts for an eternity. Right? All believers are, are unified. They have access to by the Spirit, to the truth, and the same wisdom that's found through the cross. You know, and it's interesting, too, that this, this, this hidden wisdom that Paul refers to, it's really just about God, right? The things of God, knowing God. But again, people can know God and can learn about God. Even non-Christians can come and read the Bible and, and learn about God, right? But the, the secret knowledge of God that he's referring to here, the wisdom of God is found in our heart, not in our heads, right? There, there's a whole lot of people that know about God, that can read a book and learn about God and have a head knowledge about him, but that's not a secret. That's written on a page <laughs> that you can learn and read. But to know God, even the depths of God that's revealed through the Spirit, you can't have that until you have a relationship with Christ. He's, he, he's the, the barrier between Again, making no sense of this world and then coming to faith in Christ and, and understanding who he is and his purpose for us in this world. You know, because there's a huge difference in knowing about something and knowing something. You know what I mean by that? There's a huge difference in, 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 in knowing about something and in knowing something, again, to be true. Knowing that you believe what you believe what you believe and, you, and it's by evidence that you believe that. Right? There's, a, there's a huge difference in knowing what the Bible teaches and actually knowing it by, through the evidence of your submission to the Bible's authority in your life. Right? As, as followers of, of Jesus, we can't be content just to know a few things about God. Right? The people in, in Corinth and outside the church even, they knew about God. And so if we're just content with a head knowledge about who God is, but it's not transforming us into a life in Christ, then what, how different are we? Right? If, if our knowledge of God isn't so deep and so great and so growing in such a way that we're, that we're pursuing him daily, that we're different from the world around us, but we're not going to be different or transformed from the world around us if we just have a head knowledge of God. We have to have it in our heart, again, driven by the spirit that lives within us. So if the, if the, the culture and the, the norms of, of secular society are infiltrating the church and the church isn't having an impact on the world around them, isn't being the light that the church is called to be, then guess who the problem is? The church is the problem. You know, I think one of the things that, that Paul's alluding to here is that it's deeper than just knowing about God. It's about living like you know God. 
in a personal relationship with him that's made possible through the Holy Spirit. And so as he closes out chapter 2, Paul continues again with this contrast between man and his thoughts and wisdom and and that which is greater and different, and that comes from God. And it's going to be our job to be able to discern between the two, to walk in obedience, walk in God's calling, and not the way of the world. So we're going to talk about uh, discernment here over these next few verses. He says in verse 11, For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God, no one knows except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. Verse 13, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. Right, that line in there, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. And so if we want to know God, if we want to know a godly wisdom, then we need and we have to rely on the Holy Spirit who's able to reveal those things to us. And that's exactly the role that the Holy Spirit plays. When Jesus was talking with his disciples, he, he talked about the Holy Spirit that was going to come in John 14, 26. He says, the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. All right, Paul continues with this contrast, verse 14. He says, A natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. He says that again, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Right, so we have the Spirit of God, but the unsaved do not hear God's Spirit. They don't follow His leading. And so why would we give in to the, the world's way of thinking, the world's way of doing things? He, again, he's writing to a culture that's, that's fixated on their own pleasure, their own desires, their own wants, self-focused, thinking only of what's best for them, not thinking about God and His kingdom and Really, that's what we're supposed to be thinking about always, is is God's kingdom first. But sometimes we can live in in fear of of what the world might say to us, what they might throw at us, what they might say about us, the relationships that we might lose because we're we're taking a stance for God. Um, You know, I remember when I was younger, when I was a a teenager, um, you know, I didn't want people thinking I was too weird. I was a Christian, but I didn't want, you know, I didn't want people thinking I was too weird. Jesus freak or whatever you want to say. And uh, so when, when, from personal experience, when you allow that to get in your head, it's going to lead to compromise in the life that you live, right? When you allow it to get in your head that, well, they might, I might lose a friendship. I might lose this. I might lose that. I might, you know, whatever. When you allow that to get in your head, it's going to lead to compromise in the life that you live, where decisions that you used to make for Christ, you're now making just because you're now making for your own self, self-pleasure, self-want because you don't want to be made fun of, or you don't want people to look at you a certain way, or, or, or whatever that is. And, um, you know, the world might not like me. The world might, they, they hated Jesus. They killed him, right? They killed Paul. They killed the disciples. Um, and, you know, and, and, and again, from personal experience, that led to me compromising in a lot of different ways in my, in my spiritual life. And I did that for a season, and praise God, I don't care now. <laughs> I don't care what the, I don't, I don't care. I follow Jesus. I, I follow Jesus. My, 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 my stance is firm in who he is and what he's done. Um, and so all that to say, like, if, if my friends or your friends are, are going to get on us for living a life for Jesus, or they're going to show some, some hatred toward, toward the life that you live in Christ, and it makes you insecure about your faith, and that leads to you compromising in your faith and doing all sorts of things and living in a way that's contra- contradictory to your faith in Jesus, then that means you and I need to get new friends. Period. Um, because those aren't friends. Right? There, there, there's a big difference in, in having non-Christian friends who, who might support what you're doing, who, who might kind of sort of like get it, but they don't fully get it. And yet, you know, they ask questions. You get to tell them about Jesus. You get to share the gospel with them. Um, and they're receptive to it. And they don't keep you from living for Jesus. There's a whole difference between that person and a person who's just going to tear you down for living for Jesus. 
He's like, why are you doing what you're doing? Why are you doing this? this is stupid. Why do you care? Th- that second person, we don't need around. Right? Because if they're going to make me compromise in my faith, they're not, wor- they're not worthy to be in my life. Because I need to live for Jesus. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm not going to read the whole chapter, I promise. Next four verses, 1 through 4. And here's what, here's what Paul says. He says, I, brethren, could not speak to you as to a spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ. I, I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now you are not yet able, for you are still fleshly. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, you are not fleshly, or you, are you not fleshly? And are you not walking like mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not mere men? See, when you first come to faith in Christ, this whole renewing of your mind thing that it talks about, that Paul talks about in Romans chapter 12, it's at its very beginning stages, right? When you come to faith in Christ, you're, you're, you're an infant in Christ, you uh, have a new relationship with him, and, and it's all about transforming into the life that, that God wants you to live now, but that's at the beginning, and so spiritually speaking, the problem that Paul has with the church that he's writing to, and he's not, he's not shy about saying it, uh, he says, you were not able to receive solid spiritual food, and I, and I love that he doesn't stop there. He says, and you're still not able, by the way. Right? He didn't just say, oh, you used to struggle a little bit, but now, you're, nope, you still struggle, because verse 3 says, you are still fleshly present day, still fleshly, right? And not only does he call him out for, for being fleshly and living according to flesh, he, he backs it up with reason. He says there's self-centeredness through, through jealousy and conflict and strife among them. And so <laughs> the way I kind of view this passage, like in, in, case, in case there's any sort of self or any sort of false confidence here in their maturity level in Christ, he, he, he throws that out the window a little bit and says, you're not at least I like to interpret it this way, you're not as mature in Christ as you thought you were. You're, you're not doing what you're called to do. You're not being the Christian that you're called to be because you're not even ready for, for more in me. Right? He says they're, they're walking. Are you not walking like mere men? Right? A super rhetorical question. He gets a little sarcastic. Uh, and he already knows the answer. Right? Rather, rather, than, rather than living countercultural. And operating in the truth of godly wisdom, they're just acting like the world around them, doing what everybody else is doing. And so in that society and in our society, again, if there's no difference in our, our behavior and the way that the world behaves, and then there's a problem, and the problem is us. When we fight, when we, we compromise our faith, when we make excuses, when we, when we give in to the things that the world offers us that keep us from walking in true wisdom, keep us from proper discernment through the Holy Spirit, Ultimately, ultimately, it's all due to one thing, real quick. It's because we take our eyes off of Jesus. Right? If, our, if our eyes are fixated on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, if our, if our eyes and our mind and our attitude and the life that we live is, is pointed toward Jesus, we're not going to have these problems. Right? But when we take our eyes of Jesus, off Jesus, when we put it onto self, when we put it onto what people might say about me, when we put it onto distractions of this world, when we put it onto a world that's full of things that aren't lasting for an eternity, there's only one thing that lasts for eternity. That's Jesus and his kingdom. But when we're fixated on other things, then we lose sight of that. And the, the problem is that we're so readily available to, to do it, to, to, to give in to, to society because of the influence that we allow it to have on our lives. Right? He says, we don't have to live with, with huge, human wisdom saying that I am of Paul, I am of Apollos. Instead, we can rely on the Holy Spirit because, again, it's not about following this person or that person. It's about following one name, the name above every other name, and his name is Jesus. And so the calling for us as a church is, is rather than being readily available to do whatever the culture wants us to do, we need to be readily available to tap into the wisdom and discernment that's only made available through the Holy Spirit as we live out our mission as a church to exalt Christ and to point others to him. So uh, a few points of application. So one, uh, again, remember that question. Remember why you believe what you believe. 
why do you believe what you believe? And the answer to Paul and the answer to us should be simple. It's Jesus Christ and him crucified. Why do you believe what you believe? Because Jesus came and he did what he said he did, did what he said he was going to do. He lived a perfect life. He, he died a death on the cross that I deserve. That's why I believe what I believe. Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's the, that's the point. Secondly, be different because you are different. Right? This world might, <laughs> might take everything from us. This world might mock us. This world might think we're crazy. Whatever. Right? If we know the truth, we know the truth of, of a risen Savior, we need to live differently from the world around us. Thirdly, walk in the wisdom that the Holy Spirit provides. The, the Bible tells us the Holy Spirit resides in us as believers in Jesus Christ, and it's the same power that raised him from the dead. It's living in you and me as a believer in Jesus. Don't you think we should probably tap into that? Right? Don't you think we should rely on the Holy Spirit's leading and wisdom and counsel and discernment in our lives? So thirdly, walk in wisdom that the Holy Spirit provides. And then lastly, you know, kind of what he, he gets to at the end is that we need to acknowledge our shortcomings. You know, acknowledge those things that we need to get rid of so that you can grow in Christ, right? Because he, he, he's, again, addressing in the beginning of chapter 3 the fact that, hey, I had, to, I had to give you milk because you weren't ready for solid food. And while that might be true of someone who's a, a new believer in Christ, to progress toward that, he, he gets on him and says, you're still that way. What's keeping us that way? Right? And so as we apply that to our own life, what is keeping me from, from more of Christ? Right? Would, would Christ say that about my life? Would he say, uh, you're not ready? How can we get ready for what Christ has for us? How can we be prepared for more growth in Christ? How can we, how can we live out our faith in Jesus, the, the sanctification process, being made more like Christ every single day? How can we grow and walk in that so that he alone would receive the glory? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for who you are and what you've done. We thank you this morning for the cross. And Father, we realize that, that some of what we have looked at this morning is kind of simple, kind of basic, kind of, it's the gospel. It's, it's Jesus Christ and him crucified. Nothing more and nothing less. And so, Father, help us to cling to that simple reality that we believe in as we give our lives over to Christ. You know, those in this room, those watching online, when, when we have made the stance for Jesus Christ in our lives, however long ago, whether today, yesterday, 10 years ago, 30 years ago, Father, we made a commitment that day to follow you and to live out your truth in the world that's in desperate need of knowing you. And so, Father, the, the task that we've been given is to, to, to stand out, to be a light in this world, a light in the darkness. And, Father, we're only going to be capable of doing that if we live with a full and complete reliance on the Holy Spirit and the role that he plays in our lives so that you may work in and through us. And again, Father, our, our, our last point this morning is, again, that in some ways, in a lot of ways probably, we, we, we struggle, we fall short. We have shortcomings that, that prevent us from being who you've called us to be. Father, it's our prayer that you would reveal those things to us. It's our prayer that you would help us, all of us, to just be honest with you, with where we're at and what things are keeping me from you, what things do I need to get rid of so that I can better serve you and love you because the reality is that it's all about you. It's not about us. It's not about a, a worldly, humanly wisdom because we know where that leads. That leads to nothing. It's about living for Christ with a, with a wisdom that's given to us, given access through the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ and him crucified, may that be why we believe what we believe. And it's in Jesus' holy and precious name that we pray. Amen. Could we rise, please? <coughs>